the naming of the new cabinet, and the attempt to relocate the government back to Mogadishu are all positive steps toward an inclusive political process. Third, the region of Puntland held elections in January leading to a new administration, and Somaliland is set to hold its own elections in May. In its review process, I trust that the administration is giving careful thought to the implications of each of these factors, and I know that you will be discussing those of various factors in today's session. However, there is a risk that if we focus too narrowly on tactical decisions, that we will continue to operate without a larger strategy. Nothing, in my view, is more important right now than getting that strategy in place, a strategy that integrates all of our national security resources, including those of the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. The situation in Somalia is complex. We cannot predict how events will play out, but we can ensure that our responses to those events fit within some kind of a coherent vision. We can ensure we don't confuse or continue to make the same mistakes. To that end, I want to outline what I see as um, the key considerations in developing a strategy for renewed engagement in Somalia. First, any strategy begins with clearly identifying and prioritizing our objectives, both in the short term and the long term. In Somalia, I believe that our goals fall into four categories. One, counterterrorism. Two, state building. Three, humanitarian concerns and human rights and for regional stability. These areas will certainly not be new to anyone in this room, but defining them up front and assessing their interrelationship is very important. Previous administration's failure to properly develop and harmonize strategic objectives resulted in conflicting agendas that often undermined one another. So let's take counterterrorism first. There are individuals and networks in Somalia that directly threaten American interests, and we need to stop them question, however, is whether tactical operations like the strikes conducted by the Defense Department underline, undermine our long-term strategic counterterrorism goals, particularly in the absence of other forms of engagement. At a Foreign Relations Committee hearing, I asked a <coughs> Defense Department official whether, in light of these strikes, we were at war in Somalia. She said no. Unfortunately, there are many Somalis who, seeing us do little else, might conclude otherwise. This combined with the association many Somalis make between the United States and the Ethiopian incursion has resulted in resentment and undermined our ability to work with the very people who could help us achieve our objectives. But let me be clear, in some cases, tactical operations against individuals and networks may be justified, especially if they have clear ties to al-Qaeda and pose a direct threat to the United States. But we need to think more about the strategic impl implications and potential risks of these operations. We need to determine where the line lies between implacable enemies and potential partners, and then figure out ways to engage at the latter. And we need to reach out to work with and support all those Somalis whose aspirations include a country free of terrorism that plagues them even more than it threatens us. Until we do, our tactical efforts, these manhunts, will remain under a cloud of suspicion. And that is a recipe for counterterrorism that is neither sustainable nor effective. So that brings us to the second objective, state building. Establishing an inclusive, open, and functional system of governance that can enforce the rule of law and provide security is a central part of a successful counterterrorism policy over the long term. U.S. support and collaboration with regional and international partners for the new national unity government must be a central component of our strategy. We must all work together to ensure it continues to grow as a legitimate and inclusive government. Although it currently has broad appeal, this unity government does have a limited window of opportunity to substantially demonstrate its commitment to these ideals. Unless it makes a real difference in people's lives, in terms of security and basic services, such as protection and trash collection and job creation, this transitional government will quickly become irrelevant as have its many predecessors. I stand ready to work with the Obama administration to determine appropriate ways we can assist that process, and I stand ready to do what I can to rally Congress to authorize the necessary funds to do so. Now let me say something about peacekeeping. In the final months of the last administration, some officials pushed peacekeeping whether the authorization of a new UN force or 
the strengthening of the African Union force as the primary solution to the crisis. I support peacekeeping missions in general and have called for a more robust mission in Somalia in the past. But peacekeeping is not the primary solution. And it is never a substitute for a viable peace agreement or an inclusive and functional government. At this point, I'm concerned that peacekeepers in Somalia will continue to be just another target of the current insurgency and add further fuel to the fighting. A carefully planned UN peacekeeping force may have an important role to play down the road, but there must first be a peace to keep. The UN Security Council, with our administration playing a leading role, has other areas that it must focus on immediately, and those relate to the third objective, humanitarian response and human rights. There have been substantial efforts to scale up the humanitarian response to Somalia, but those efforts have been impeded by the increasing killings and abductions of aid workers. This is unacceptable. The international community should make that clear and take steps in tandem with the government and civil society to restore the integrity of humanitarian space. At the same time, any effective strategy towards Somalia needs to incorporate accountability. Our State Department Human Rights Report notes that the country's poor human rights situation deteriorated even further during 2008. Addressing the problem of impunity is not easy in the midst of state collapse, but it is nonetheless essential. We should work closely with other members of the UN Security Council in consultation with the Secretary General to consider ways to better investigate, publicize, and sanction those who orchestrate a human rights violations. This effort should also apply to those who fund and arm uh, violators. This leads into the <coughs> fourth and final objective, regional, regional stability. I think we can all agree that the crisis in Somalia is driven not only by internal factors, but also, of course, by external ones. It's impossible to separate the situation in Somalia from wider regional tensions, especially the historic tensions between Ethiopia and Eritrea and the instability in Yemen to name but a few. Renewed engagement in Somalia requires renewed engagement with the wider region. And this has been missing over recent years. And it's an essential component of any effective strategy towards Somalia. And is why I believe we need a senior level envoy for the Horn of Africa, not just Somalia. We need someone who can drive a more comprehensive approach to the region and partner with key regional bodies, including IGAD and the Arab League. This diplomat needs to have full-time staff and resources, but also work closely with our ambassadors and embassies in the region. What I said in 2007 remains true today. Strengthening our diplomatic and intelligence capacities is essential if we are to effectively pursue strategic objectives in Somalia. However, that said, I want to add a caveat to that statement now. All of our best diplomatic efforts will fail if we do not deal directly with the mistrust of U.S. intentions that has developed among Somalis over the last two years. This mistrust undermines our ability to engage constructively with different parties, and it is easily manipulated by al-Shabaab. I believe the Obama administration has a unique opportunity in the early months of the administration to change this perception. And to that end, I recently sent a letter to President Obama urging him to make a public statement that he intends to make a clear break from past policies towards Somalia. I'm convinced that doing so could make a tremendous impression on ordinary Somalis and open doors for renewed U.S. engagement in Somalia. In per perhaps no other place in the world is there a greater need and opportunity for high-level public diplomacy. Achieving stability and restoring the rule of law in Somalia will not be easy or quick. Eighteen years of dysfunction have proven that. But I am optimistic as a result of both new political dynamics in Somalia and new leadership in the White House that we have a unique opportunity to take critical steps in that direction right now. I think no one will dispute that allowing the status quo to persist or al-Shabaab to expand is unacceptable. The question is whether we will respond haphazardly, as we have in the past, or strategically with an understanding of what we know and what we don't, what we control and what we can't. I've offered some thoughts for how we can do the latter, but they are, of course, uh, by no means exhausted. It could not be more timely that CIA, CSIS has brought you all together today. I urge you to think big and boldly 
and assessing both the lessons of the past and the opportunities uh, 